Happy Friday. All right. So quiz is done. And first thing we're going to start out with after the quiz, we're going to talk a little bit about your reading from the from the book. So you all had to read the prologue and uh, chapter one and chapter two. And again, the story is about the founding of Theranos. And it's more of a kind of a biography of Elizabeth Holmes, but it's not told exclusively about exclusively from Elizabeth Holmes perspective. There's a lot of other characters. Um, so I'm going to kind of lead into that and kind of tell you what you'd expect moving forward. I also want to talk about some things that should have jumped out to you saying, oh, this is something that uh, is a little bit sus, a little bit uh, worrisome. Um, so basically, uh, there were, again, not an auditing case, but actually talks about some elements that are very relevant to our consideration of auditing. And so uh, that's kind of why I like this book. Now, I started out reading this book. There is a lot of literature and a lot of media out there about Elizabeth Holmes. Uh, there's a series of podcasts done by ABC called The Dropout. Uh, there was actually a TV series on Hulu, also called The Dropout, that, uh, what's the name of that actress that played her? Um, the girl from Mean Girls, I can't remember her name, but... Uh, but what, what's that? Amanda Seyfried. Amanda Seyfried, yeah, that's right, okay. Amanda Seyfried is in it, uh, and uh, like William H. Macy was also in it, uh, played a character that you guys haven't been introduced yet, but uh, it was it was very interesting because it was a different take on the story. It was a little bit more sympathetic to Elizabeth Holmes and her upbringing, uh, but uh, largely the same story. There are some things that kind of come up in the in the story that are they, they take some creative license with, but overall, it's some interesting, interesting stuff, and uh, part of the reason for it is I think, uh, as we're going to see as we go through this, uh, Silicon Valley was kind of uh, had some issues um, with its diversity. Silicon Valley was kind of the haven for very, very rich white men to go to and uh, raise venture capital. And you can kind of see uh, examples of this. They talk about it throughout the book. They talk about Larry Ellison. They talk about Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, who all kind of got their start in that area. And one of the reasons has been speculated why Elizabeth Holmes is so successful, apart from the fact that she was just an incredible incredible salesperson she just had this this mesmerizing captivating ability but she also uh um that you know she was kind of a, one of the first females in this area that actually uh had some success and that everybody really wanted her to be successful and that kind of obfuscated the fact that there were problems here and so uh that's what we're going to see over the course of the uh of the course of the book but it starts out pretty strong starts out the strong so in the beginning of the book uh what happens at the beginning of the book so we have uh the cfo that's uh, started at the beginning of the book and CFO uh, is pretty happy. He's in good shape. And uh, he, this is a uh, founder CFO. I, why am I blanking on his name? Um, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but it's kind of his uh, little story from his perspective. So they just got back from a trip to Switzerland to visit Pfizer and the trip went perfectly, right? Okay. I'm expecting you guys to respond when I say something that's obviously false. Okay. And if you don't respond, I'm going to assume you didn't read the book. Yes. Uh, yeah, I think Harry is his name. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so, uh, yeah, no, no, things went really badly on the trip to Pfizer. The the uh, the um, the Theranos, I think it was Theranos 1.0 is what they're using, but the device that they're using did not work. So how did they fix the problem? They beamed in phony results. All right. They beamed in phony results. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about this. So this is kind of the first thing that should have just kind of tweaked you. It's like, all right. I'm an auditor. I know what fraudulent activity is. This sounds like fraudulent activity and, and definitely fraudulent activity. And by the way, this is not the first time we're going to see that over the course of this book. There is a lot of it going on. So first kind of resonation with respect to our career is going to be this is fraud. This is this is a misrepresentation of a, a, a operational position. It's not really one of the it doesn't really fit cleanly into misrepresentation of financial statements, but still representation of a position. Uh, there's going to be a lot more of that going on when we talk about the misrepresentation. It's it's very misleading, and that's part of the reason that there was such a big lawsuit, the fiasco with the SEC, is that the stakeholders were misled as to the operations of this organization. But uh, yeah, that was kind of the uh, the beckoning call. So uh, Harry goes to Elizabeth and says, "Hey, uh, I'm I'm a little bit concerned about this. This this doesn't seem right. We are misleading uh, we're misleading our investors, misleading our stakeholders in our position." And so Elizabeth says, you know what, you're right. We probably should back off, right? That's exactly what Elizabeth said, right? No, Elizabeth said, get out, okay? I don't think you're a team player. By the way, this is also not the first time Elizabeth has fired somebody in the book, just so you know. So it's kind of setting up the set of stage for that. <laughs> so then they talk a little bit about uh, Elizabeth's upbringing. And uh, what did Elizabeth say she wanted to be when she grew up? Does anybody remember that story? This is actually going to be one of the questions on the quiz, but I changed it. 
billionaire. billionaire, okay? Are you sure you don't want to be president? Says, no, the president will want to marry me because I have a billion dollars, all right? So that's a very definitive an approach. And a lot of uh, a lot of interesting uh, interesting um, counterplay was given according to the family. So she had uh, what I would consider to be a little bit of an overbearing father. Her father was, uh, is, is a, a, they don't really go into as much detail, but there, there's some other information that lead, leads out there. Father was uh, kind of very unsuccessful in his endeavors. Very intelligent man, very hardworking man, but never really kind of got the respect and notoriety reserve. Reserve, and he was a very prideful man. And so they talked about his bitterness about uh, the Fleischmann fortune and his grandfather and father squandering it. And so that was uh, something that was kind of resonated throughout Elizabeth. And, and it was obvious in her upbringing. It's like have a purpose driven life. So uh, Elizabeth went off to what college? Stanford, yes, and Stanford, which was right in the heart, it's hard Silicon Valley, uh, and uh, finished a degree in four years. Now, there's a reason that the whole series is called The Dropout, okay? The reason the whole series is called Dropout, she dropped out after the first year. Technically speaking, she dropped out, kind of kind of dropped out after the first semester, because she really wasn't actively involved uh, after that. And then uh, after her first year, she started up uh, the company. And I don't remember what the original company was really called, originally called, but uh um, they came up on the name a little bit later of Theranos, which there's a Wikipedia page that talks about this. And uh, I won't go in, I won't spoil it because it's part of the book, but uh, there's a funny story about this name. Her her idea was this sounds like a cool name. Um, uh, it sounds like a mixture of therapy and diagnosis. That was that was her idea. Um, later on, there's going to be a, a, a researcher, a medical researcher who's got Greek origins and is going to talk about the, the, the foundation of this name. And it's completely and totally different than what you would want to think. But uh, I remember when I first heard this name, uh, this is actually when uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe was really, really big. And of course, uh, this is like when Avengers, Avengers uh, Infinity War and Avengers Endgame came up. And what was the baddie in that? Thanos. And then I hear Theranos. And I said, oh, well, that's, that's kind of strange. OK, that's a bit daunting. But uh, yeah, that was kind of something that was in the media right around the same time, right around the same time. So 19 year old starts up this company. And uh, does anybody remember what her original idea was, like what what she was going to create? It was originally going to be a medical patch. It was going to be something on here. And she had grand aspirations for the patch because the patch was going to contain drugs. And it was also going to contain a diagnostic kit. So it's going to be very nanotechnology that was going to be able to not only uh, mod or monitor a patient's activity through micro needles, but I'll, or sorry, not monitor activity, but also inject drugs through micro needles. And so, kind of a cool idea. But what did the her co-founder Shinnok Roy, uh, co-founder, what did what would what did he kind of conclude that this was? What was the term that he used? Science fiction said this sounds like science fiction, which honestly, uh, if you go back and look at some of the science fiction, the, like the old Star Trek shows, this this borders kind of on that, which uh, we may be there in sometime in the future, but we're not there yet. So they moved over to this uh, blood testing kit. And the idea being is that uh, she had a fear of needles. And so she didn't want to do those draws. And it, has anybody had their blood tested uh, and had to go through that? I mean, I'm getting older, so I'm having to do that a lot more regularly, which sucks. But uh, they have to draw like big vites. And basically, uh, you have to tap your vein and have to pick this, this needle that's about that big, you know, and put it in your arm and then pull out the blood. And I, I get that. That sucks. And that, but so she said she wanted to start a company that could actually do it from just a finger prick, which would actually be a lot cooler because a finger prick is a lot less painful than them, you know, injecting a jackhammer in your arm. So. Um, so that was the entire goal of the company. And uh, chapter, chapter two gets into a little bit about this. It talks about Ed Koo and how he wants to do that. He was an engineer. He came in. He said, uh, um, uh, this is a, the biggest task I've ever had. I, I, this is daunting. She, she basically wants the impossible. By the way, that's a theme that will resonate throughout the book about Elizabeth's demands for basically impossible things that were just not realistic. So... Um, uh, what was kind of this is this is something that resonates also with the uh, the uh, practice. What was the kind of the uh, um, complaint he had about his ability to pro progress, about his ability to make progress on these tasks? One of the major kind of major issues that uh, we're going to talk about over the course of the semester. They couldn't yeah, they couldn't communicate between parts of the uh, parts of the organization, which. That doesn't make any intuitive sense to any of, any of us, okay? We're, we're very, very understanding of this concept of transparency. And usually when we talk about transparency, we're talking about external users versus internal users. But this is actually people internal in the company doesn't know what the rest of the company is doing. This will happen again frequently throughout, and we're going to talk about it, but that transparency issue is certainly problematic. 
So Elizabeth's really, really upset. Says, I want more progress. Let's open the company and let it run 24 hours a day. Ed says, no. And so then she says, all right, well, I'm going to hire a whole bunch of people that are going to compete with you. And they ended up coming up with the first uh, the first real working version of the Theranos device. They called it the Edison. At least that was the, the name that Elizabeth gave it. What was the actual name, the the, the nickname they gave it? The glue bots, because it was uh, re from a repurposed glue robot. Okay. And uh, yeah, the Edison will actually make an appearance uh, multiple times throughout the book, but uh, there's there's certainly some issues with that. So yeah, that was kind of the starting point. And uh, hopefully uh, hopefully you kind of picked up on a couple issues. Again, uh, fraud is going to be a big one and the transparency issues. Uh, we're not quite there yet, but when we start getting to later chapters, please make sure you pay attention to kind of the corporate culture because corporate culture definitely plays a role in how we think about auditing. And a lot goes to in this book about the nature of corporate culture. You can probably predict where we're going with this. Uh, there was also another a character that was mentioned very briefly, but it's going to play a much bigger role through the book. So did anybody pick up uh, Elizabeth had a romantic entanglement in the book? So it was Ramesh Balwani, also known as Sonny. OK, and he will play a massive role in the book later on. But uh, current, right now, he's just kind of a side character. All right. So let's go ahead and let's talk about uh, I think. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to pause here. I'm sure. All right, we're back. All right. So some of these questions were very easy. You should be able to answer from uh, information you already know about auditing. Some of this work, I legitimately expected you not to know the answers to. And you, I expect you to do the research to answer the questions. If you looked at a question and you said, I don't know the answer, I'm just going to circle a random answer. That is something you may have to do on the CPA exam. Please do not take that approach for this course. The reason I give you questions that you may not know the answer to is that I want you to actually find the answer on your own. They're not particularly hard to find, but it's just going to have to do some work. And getting into the habit of doing that research and looking up that information is going to be beneficial to you. This first question is an example of a question that I do not expect you to know the answer to because we've not talked about it in depth, but is very relevant and important. So which of the following best describes what is meant by the term generally accepted auditing standards? So we've talked about GAS, G-A-S, and we've said there the standards kind of dictate the behavior of our profession. But this is actually saying, what do these re what do these regulate? What do these oversee? So if you went and looked this up, it's actually not particularly hard to figure out. But if you didn't, you might have to be make guess guessing on this. So the, first, let's go through the answers. Rules acknowledged by the accounting profession because they're universal in application. So first of all, can generally accepted auditing standards be rules acknowledged by the accounting profession? No, auditing is a subset of accounting. So we can't actually say that these are acknowledged by the accounting profession. Are these pronouncements pronouncements issued by the auditing standard board? No, what do we call those? Does anybody remember? I've said it a couple times in this course already. Statements on auditing standards, SASs. Those are pronouncements by the auditing standards board, not GASs. Measures the quality of the auditor's performance. Well, if you remember, we talked about this very briefly in 417, but GAS is composed of three categorical standards, general standards, standards of reporting, standards of field work, which actually measure the quality of audit performance in this area. So that's our answer. But let's talk about why D is not the answer. Procedures used to gather evidence to support financial statements. This, again, could be categorized as either PCOB auditing standards or uh, statements on auditing standards, depending on what type of company you're talking about. So C is our answer. Number two, I felt bad about number one, so I gave you an easy one, okay? This should be one that if you didn't remember immediately that you could have done some little bit of work to uh, look up and uh, find this out, because we actually talked about this in our lectures. Which of the following terms identifies a requirement for audit evidence? So we have certain terms that are used to define uh, the quantity and quality of audit evidence. What are those two terms? And I'll give you a hint, one of them is up here. On, up here. Sufficient and appropriate audit. Sufficiency is the quality or quantity of evidence and appropriateness is the quality of evidence. So those are two that you should already know because we talked about it again in this course and in 417. We want to make sure we have sufficient appropriate audit evidence and that those terms are going to come up uh, quite a bit. I think actually uh, they came up in your answers. They actually use the term sufficient appropriate. So you could have uh, picked that up. So A is our answer. Which of the following properly describes the auditor's responsibilities as opposed to management's responsibilities? So this question actually comes up, or this type of question kind of comes up a lot in the, our, our reviews. So remember, management's responsible for the financial statements and or the preparation and presentation of financial statements and the design, implementation, and maintenance of internal controls. Auditor's responsible for testing those and determining that they're operating properly and fairly stated. So that's what we're looking for. So going through the answers, auditor's responsible for the entity's financial statements. Okay, we can already toss that out right there because we know that's not correct. Auditor's not responsible for the financial statements. 
Auditor is responsible for identifying the laws and regulations applicable to any of these activities. That is not true. The auditor does not have responsibility in there. If they are designed to test compliance on there, they should be defined for them. They will test that. Manager is responsible for these financial statements. Auditor is responsible for the selection and application of accounting principles. Do we as auditors go in and say, you're supposed to use GAAP? Nope, that's not our job. That's not our job. So manager is responsible for affirming the effects of any uncorrected misstatements. The financial statements are immaterial. So this does not say they're trying to evaluate and determine if they are material. This is where the auditor would come in and say, you have a material misstatement and management either negates or affirms that assessment, which would be true because the auditor or the management has to actually determine whether they want to correct any misstatements. So that's a correct statement. The auditor is responsible for obtaining reasonable assurance about whether the financial statements are free from material misstatement. That is definitely a correct statement. That is actually part of the audit report. So D is a little bit hard to uh, dissect, but it is our correct answer. D is our answer. All right, another little fairly easy question. So uh, sufficient appropriate audits. I said it was gonna come up, so that word, those words came up. So uh, basically uh, they attended uh, the, um, a subsequent event uh, requiring adjustment of the financial limits occurred on April 10th, year two. They decided not to dual date the report and completes the extended audit procedure for subsequent events on April 24th, year two. So if an adjustment is made without disclosure of the event, so this is basically saying they are not dual dating the report, what should the uh, report be dated? So there's actually only two options. There's April 10th or there's April 24th. Is it the date of the event or the date of the uh, subsequent or the procedures that had to be done? Now, I gave you a bit of a misnomer when I walked up here. I said, okay, this is the date of the event. We do it throughout there. This is, of course, assuming the auditor goes in and they finish the test work on the day of the event. That would be the case. So when if you were thinking, well, Dr. Barnes said the date of the event, I did say that you are correct. And I misspoke. I probably should have said the date through which the audit procedures are extended through because it took them two weeks to actually perform audit procedures after the event occurred. So that is our answer is C, April 24th, year two. If you knew it was one of these two, then you then I'm happy with your logic there. But if you didn't get the right answer because of the way I misspoke, I apologize. But hopefully we've got that clarified now. It's going to be the date through which the uh, reporting work will be extended and when it's completed. Which of the following events occurred after the client's calendar year end, but before the audit report date will require disclosure in the notes of the financial statements, but no adjustments to the financial statements. So what, what are we talking about here? What is this concept that we're dealing with in this particular question? It's a type two, or so it's something one event and we're trying to determine if it's type one or type two. So which type of event would require disclosure, but no adjustment? So probably a type one event or sorry, sorry type, type two event, excuse me, type two event. So something, a situation where conditions did not exist as of the balance sheet date. So new convertible bonds are issued to expand the company's product line. What do you guys think on that one? That sure sounds like a type two event to me, okay? Something that's significant enough, but uh, it's not going, it's not relevant to the previous year. So I'll hold on to that one. That's likely our answer. A loss report on uncollectible accounts on an acknowledged distressed customer. Did the uh, un uncollectible accounts exist as of the balance sheet date? Yes. Okay. So we knew that that was a pop, uh, possibility. So then we just fixed that number. We instead of being an, instead of being a d allowance for uncollectible accounts, we actually just write off the accounts receivable. That's a type one event. Fixed asset used in operations is sold at a substantial profit. That's also what we consider to be a type two event, but it's likely not going to be large enough for us to uh, consider ourselves or consider if we're talking about a divestiture of a significant part of the company, like they uh, they sell part of the company, that would be a significant subsequent event. But sale of an asset, probably not, okay? So C is uh, probably type two, but just not big enough to be considered a subsequent event. Negotiations resulted in compensation adjustments for union, or union employees retroactive to the fourth quarter. Is this a subsequent event? Yes. Is it a type one or type two? Likely a type one, because it says retroactive to the fourth quarter, okay? So our answer is going to be A here. It's going to be A. All right. An annual shareholder's report includes audited financial statements. It contains a report by management operations. The audited financial statements are fairly stated. The auditor is not engaged to report on other information included in the annual report, but the auditor notices there is a material inconsistency between the amount of revenue reported by management in the report on operations and the amount of revenue reported in the audited financial statements. If management refuses to make the revision to the revenue included in management's report on operations, the auditor least likely would do what? Okay, least likely would do what? So this is an interesting question. And by the way, uh, I don't like it when they do stuff like this. I would rather they say the auditor most likely would do what, because it's a little bit easier to dissect. But uh, let's go ahead and let's walk through whether or not the auditor would do those things. So first of all, what we're talking about here is the financial statements are correct. 
information that's derived from the financial statements is incorrect, which we talked about a little bit in 417. Remember that annual report? I said, here's the big McDonald's cheeseburger or the McDonald's Big Mac, and uh, this information has to be consistent with the financial statements. What could the auditor do if that information is not consistent? So could they include in the audit report a separate section describing the inconsistency? Sure sounds like a possibility. So I'd say, yeah, that's a possibility. So that's a likely possibility. Could they withhold the use of the audit report? Say, look, you're presenting information that's inconsistent with what we audited. We are not going to let you use the audit report. Is that something they could do? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Withdraw from the engagement. That seems like an extreme circumstance, but it's certainly a possibility. But let's talk about the fourth option. Modify the opinion on the audit of financial statements to a qualified or adverse opinion. So if we're talking about a qualified or adverse opinion, we're saying we believe there is a departure from generally accepted accounting principles. Is there a de de departure from generally accepted accounting principles listed here? No, their, their financial statements are correct with respect to GAAP. They are consistent with GAAP. The issue is not a GAAP issue, so we can't be can't be D. It's least likely to be D because D is reserved for GAAP issues. That's why D is our answer. So again, may have had to do some research there, but that was the logic you wanted to approach in answering this question. Helpful company is not for profit entity prepared its financial statements and accounting basis prescribed by a regulatory agency solely, solely fine for the agency. Green audited the financial statements in accordance with the generally accepted auditing standards. And include the financial statements were fairly presented on the prescribed basis. Green should issue a what? So let's just answer the question right out. Is it okay for a non non public client, from a private company or a not for profit in this situation, to report on a basis of accounting other than generally accepted accounting principles? That is absolutely fine, okay? Our audit would not be conducted in accordance with general accepted accounting principles. It would, are over a jet gap, it would be on whatever the regulatory basis is, but that's absolutely fine. So if that's fine and everything was correct, what type of report are we gonna issue? Single unmodified opinion on the special purpose financial statements? Yep, that's our answer, that's our answer there, okay. So everybody feeling good about that? I see a lot of people are just really, really just like, oh my gosh, I'm just really worried about this now. Yeah, what's up? Can we talk about six again? I'm gonna be honest, sure. I don't understand that question. So you're saying there's like <laughs> nothing materially misstated by the information that's pulled from So the, the information is presented incorrectly, okay? It, but it's not presented incorrectly in the financial statements, it's presented in, in, in information that's associated with the financial statements. General accepted accounting principles tells us that the financial statements have to be correct. They have to be uh, the accounting treatment has to be consistent with what the uh, what the what uh, is the FASB expects it to be. The client has done that. They have followed GAAP. The financial statements are uh, materially correct. We'll just say it like that. So this is not a generally accepted accounting principles issue. The only way that we could modify the opinion according to what's listed there as a qualified or adverse opinion would be is if there was a violation of generally accepted accounting principles, which there's not. Now, does that mean the client is not doing something wrong? They're absolutely doing something wrong, but it's not a violation of GAAP. Instead, it's a violation of presentation of information external to the financial statements. So again, this was a challenging question, but you had to be able to identify, is this a gap issue or not? And if the answer is no, it's not, that's where you'd say D has to be our answer. What would an example of that be like a non-gap issue in this case that would, like what, what would you be talking about? What would they do that would cause the situation, you know what I'm saying? So what, what would be an example of a gap issue or a non-gap issue? Non issue. Well, so this would be an example of a non-gap issue because, uh, Basically, generally accepted account, a violation of GAAP would be uh, like using using an incorrect inventory evaluation method, like a not not, not approved inventory evaluation method, something that manipulates the value the evaluation of the financial statements or presentation of information in the financial statements, like failing to disclose uh, a material liability, uh, failing to uh, include a financial statement. Those are all examples of information that would be GAAP violations. So if it's not a violation of the financial statement presentation and disclosure or information presentation itself, it's not a gap violation. It's still it's still an incorrect presentation of information, just not financial statement information. Good question, though. It is a bit confusing, but then again, that's why we're talking about these questions. All right. Let's go ahead and talk about the task based simulation. All right. So I want to talk really quickly about this TBS. I like this TBS a lot. I do not like Becker's answer to the TBS. So if you encounter this as you're preparing for the CPA exam, they're going to give you a different answer. I honestly think Becker is wrong on this one. Okay, I think Becker is wrong on this one. That doesn't come up very often, uh, but I will have gripes about some of the things that Becker does. 
Um, actually, Ryan showed me a, a question, which uh, we're going to be doing that question in the future. I decided to go ahead and do it. Uh, so it'll be easy for you. Uh, Brian, Ryan showed me a question where they, uh, the vernacular that Becker uses is completely inconsistent and uh, I don't like it. But again, that's something you have to get used to because that's something you may encounter on the CPA exam. So uh, what you had to do here is basically you were going through analytical procedures and you're trying to determine based on the information presented in the fine analytical procedures, are you happy with the information? So you had to do some calculations and uh, then you had to determine was the calculation based on reliable information and then what's the nature of the difference. So let's talk about this first one. First one basically is calculating gross margin percentage, which you can actually do for year one and year two. It's pretty straightforward. So what is gross margin again? What is that calculation? Sales minus cost of goods sold. So that's gross margin. Gross margin percentage is just the percentage of the, that gross margin amount divided by the sales amount. Okay. So that's all you had to do. By the way, a good question came up. Um, uh, do we include other items in here? And the answer is no, you would just include cost of sales and sales. So sales must cost of sales. So uh, that's going to be uh, whatever that number is, you're going to divide it out. You hopefully came up with 41.9% here and 39.8% here. So a year over year percentage change of 2.1% because that's difference. Now, I do want to hold on to that because what Becker says is they actually tell you to take a percentage of the percentage. They say, now calculate whatever this percentage difference is and say, what is 2.1% of 3.9%? And they say it's like 5.3%. So they come up with a completely different answer. I do think that answer is wrong and I'll justify it here in just a second. So 2.1% and then uh, if we talk about 2.1% of gross profit, so uh, we can actually do the math. Oops, uh, we can actually do the math. So the gross profit amount, the actual gross profit amount for year year one, which is the basis for they're actually doing, is going to be 1411500 one, minus 850,000. So that's 561 times 2 point, or oops, 0 0.021 is 11,791 dollars. Now, why is this relevant? Why am I bringing this number up? What did they say the materiality amount was for a given account? Mm -hmm. 40,000. Is this less than 40,000? Yes. That's why I say that this is not a material number. Again, Becker will say something different and Becker's wrong. Okay. And I'm very, very consistent with this, but let's just talk about the, uh, based on this information, how we approach this. So let's assume that this gross margin calculation, this is not a material difference. How do we feel about the reliability of this information? What do you guys think? Is this reliable or not reliable? I'm pretty happy with the reliability. It comes directly from the income statement. So we're going to talk about that's reliable. We actually have foundational numbers that we can use to calculate these. And these are given numbers. One of these is given from an audit of financial statement in the previous year. So very high reliability there. So we're gonna evaluate the significance of the difference. All right, we've already said this difference is immaterial. Do we need to do any further investigation? No, if it's immaterial, then we're just happy to, to move on with our lives, okay? So that should be answer the question. And uh, I didn't make the, the box large enough that you could fit the entire answer. I apologize for that, you know? I didn't check my answers, so I apologize. Now, if you want to kick ding me in my evaluations, that's fair. All right, let's go to part two. So based on square footage and external interest rate data. So they actually gave you some information near the end of the tabs and they said, all right, here's the uh, square footage uh, for the industry. And uh, oh, you can kind of tell that I was kind of uh, merging stuff together because uh, oh, why, is that, why is there a split there? That's just annoying. Anyway, uh, so Based on the square footage, you can actually come up with an estimate. And this is an example of a model that we talked about with the uh, analytical procedure. So let's see what uh, the ex expectation versus actual come up. So actual is pretty straightforward because actual just comes from the financial statements. This should be year two sales, actual 1506900. What about the expectation? What'd you guys come up with on this one? 1536480. Anybody disagree with that one? So Dr. Barnes, I didn't do this one. It's like, if you hand it in and didn't do it, it's going to be very disappointing. That will be a problem. But uh, yeah, hopefully you came up with that number because that is correct. So we have a dollar difference of $29,580. Again, what was our materiality amount? $40,000. So this is less than materiality. So we have an immaterial difference. What do you guys think about the reliability of this particular data? I kind of like the reliability. This is an example of an, a model that we would use and it uses external information. So... We're not biased by customer uh, or our client's uh, direction. So uh, there's no bias really implicit in there. So I think we'll say this is reliable. If we come up with an external model that actually comes up close, then that's going to give us a lot of assurance that this number is, is consistent. Okay. So evaluate the significant difference. We already said it's immaterial. Do we need to investigate any further? 
Nope. Okay, we can move on. Part three. All right, this one's the dicey one. This one's the dicey one. So hopefully I picked up that one. So again, actual sales, 1506900. All right, what was the uh, expectation of sales based on commission? Can anybody come up with that? Really afraid to speak, Dr. Barnes. So my answers have been wrong so far right now. So, so again, if you did the based on commission, it's a 5%. And so you took the commission amount and divided by 5%. So let's just do that. I think that's all I had to do. So the commission expense, 78,900 divided by 0 0.05, 1,578,000. Somebody, somebody would be breathing sigh of relief. So that's, that's what I came up with. And some of you are like, I don't know what he just did. So... You better learn how to do this real quick. So, one million five hundred seventy-eight thousand. So we have a dollar difference of seventy-one thousand one hundred dollars. So, what is this a material difference? Yes. Okay. So let's go ahead and talk about this down here. Difference of material. Do we want to investigate further? Absolutely. If we have a material difference, almost always we're going to have to investigate. There's no way we can say there's a material difference. All right. That's all there is to it. Let's go one through. If that doesn't work that way. Let's talk about the reliability of data. This one's kind of the dicey one, all right? Is this data reliable or unreliable? It came, it, again, it came from the, in, the, the internal memo and also came from the income statement. So I already used income statement information one time and said it was reliable. So should be reliable, right? What is the problem with the using using this particular number as the basis for calculation? Barrel cycles, high risk. That's one. That's one. So you look to the cut. Uh, if you look to the convertible control summary sheet, it's high risk right here. Okay, so that's one ring. We didn't really talk about the revenue cycle, but it's low revenue cycle, and any revenue generated numbers are going to be uh, very low. But if we're using a payroll cycle generated number, there's high risk associated with that. Is there anything else that kind of is counterintuitive to using a con commissions expense for as a model basis? How is commission calculated? Percentage of sales. So I'm using a percentage of sales to calculate this number and then using this number to calculate sales. You guys know about uh, circular references in Excel? This sure sounds like a circular reference, okay? I'm using this number to calculate this number and then using this number as a basis for justifying this number right here. That seems really inconsistent. So even if I came up with a number that I thought was that, that was reasonable and it was not material difference, I would still second guess that number simply because this number is already the basis for this number. I don't use this number to justify this number back. All right, that's the problem that I have with this particular one. So a high high risk associated with the uh, control summary, which we really didn't talk about, but that's very relevant here. And then the basis for which this number used. So I'm gonna say not reliable. So this is definitely an area where we'd have to do additional work as part of our testing. So any questions on this? You probably walked into this one and you said, I don't know what we're doing. I don't remember talking about it here. We, we've done similar modeling like this. So this should have been somewhat familiar from 417. The key to this one was, and you're gonna encounter this a lot as we go through these task-based simulations, we are going to encounter problems that you don't seem, that don't seem familiar. And I'm not gonna be able to give you examples of every single problem you run into. The important thing is to take a breath and approach these questions and saying, what is it asking me to do? And how is what is the best approach to doing that? I will tell you these will become easier over time. This first one, you probably spent a lot of time on. You were wringing your hands and probably shaking your head. Once you actually get some time to work through it, it will be challenging. The task-based simulations will never become easy. Um, remember, we talked about Bloom's taxonomy, said that uh, there's remembering and understanding, there's uh, application analysis and evaluation. I'm picking ones that are very high in analysis and evaluation because of the highest order of thinking skills. This was the highest one, by the way, this is evaluation. So if you got any part of this right, you should feel really good about it because you're already moving in the right direction. But if you got wrong, don't feel bad about it. We're going to try to get you there. All right. With that, we are done for today. Have a wonderful weekend. Remember, please make sure that you read the Enron case before you come into class on Monday. If you're reading it while you're in the middle of class, I'm going to throw something at you.